It's great to be here speaking on this theme as an architect of seizing the future because the future has a really special place for architects. The buildings that I design today are going to be around for a long time, maybe centuries, if I'm lucky, and well, if I design well, and I'm lucky. And so the more clear and uh, powerful, the, the more positive and clear that vision of the future is, the better I can build my buildings today to make that better uh, future world come about. And so I want to share with you today a kind of vision of that future that I would like my buildings to contribute to. I've always had a sense of mission about architecture. And um, when I started my practice about 10 years ago, I knew I would focus on sustainability. And I got very quickly to the point of realizing that energy efficiency was something I should focus on. Because energy affects climate change. It affects pollution, which affects environmental and human health. It affects political stability around the globe. And it's one of the most uh, powerful things we can do as architects, because energy is primarily consumed in buildings. So I went to the Passive House Institute, United States, and I got training in the building science and the design strategies and the energy modeling to figure out to learn how to design the most energy efficient buildings in the world. And this chart here kind of shows a comparison between old buildings uh, to built to code buildings. That's what the code requires down to passive house buildings. You see it's about a 10 times reduction in heating and cooling energy and about a 75% reduction in energy overall. So it's a big deal. And this is done before we start putting on the technology like uh, photovoltaics or geothermal, um, wind power. These are, these are things that have their place. But the beauty of the passive approach is that the part of the building that remains um, is saving uh, energy by virtue of design and craftsmanship all along. And I'm proud to have designed the first certified passive house buildings to be built in the Chicago area. But I began to ask myself if it's enough energy efficiency, because in the end, it's really about doing less harm. But I started asking myself, how do we design buildings that actually do good for us uh, in terms of our health and our happiness, and not just doing less harm? And so in other words, if energy efficiency is what we need to survive, what do we need in the built environment to thrive? And I think the place to look for an answer to a question like that is in the very distant past and how the environment through evolution has shaped us as a species. And so I'm going all the way back to the very beginning, the first hominids coming down onto the savanna and uh, living as hunter-gatherers around a million years ago. And uh, this is the world that, that, that we, I'll say, experienced. Uh, modern Homo sapiens comes onto the scene about 100,000 years ago. And so you're looking at an enormous amount of time that we were imprinting ourselves upon this landscape, upon nature as we call it now. Then it was just the world, right? It was the neighborhood. It was the grocery store, the hardware store, the dating site. It was, it was everything, you know? And uh, now we have, uh, we've built a, a separation. So anyway, moving through this landscape and these textures of plant and uh, animal, and leaf and nut, we had to discern through understanding of nature patterns what would make us thrive. So, we get to modern agriculture at about 10,000 years ago, and we start living in cities, we start settling, and it's only in the last 100 years that we have sort of changed the tables from being, uh, turned the tables from being that one animal living out in the world with all the other animals to a dominant species that has constructed an environment that we live in that is actually separate from the natural world. So it's sort of a new phenomenon. And uh, if, we, if we were to look at this, put, put this into perspective, uh, look at the 24-hour day of, uh, look, at, look at the million years of human evolution as a 24-hour day. We're talking about the last 8.6 seconds. And for those other 23 hours and 59 minutes and 51 seconds, we were living outside. So it gave us a kind of, uh, it, it formed our genome. And our, our, our genome is expecting this kind of input from the environment that we're not giving it. So what is that doing to us? Well. Um, if we look at it just in, the, in those last hundred years, uh, we see an amazing migration from rural to urban. This, this, this is worldwide. We're looking at 1900, about less than 25% of the population living in cities. And we go to 1950, we're about a little over 25%. 2000, almost 50%. We've just crossed this year into the majority of people live in cities, not in the country. And it's projected that by 2100, we'll have, have turned the tables entirely the opposite way, so that less than 25% of the world's population will live outside of cities. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with cities. This is where our culture thrives, our science, our technology. This is all critical 
about who we are as a species also. But we have to think about what signals we're getting from the environment that we've created and how we can shape that environment to, so that we can uh, thrive. So in other words, to put it in perspective, this was going for a drink uh, 100,000 years ago. And, and it could be this today. I'm going to drive down and get a plastic bottle at 7-Eleven. And so you have to ask yourself, are we missing something? You know, we might be missing something in the environment here that will make us happy and healthy. And there's been a great uh, field of study in the last uh, few years especially um, about how our exposure to the natural world uh, can help our health and how lack of exposure to the natural world can be detrimental to our health. And this body of knowledge, um, you're looking at like stress response and, and, and blood uh, lipids or, or blood pressure, um, emotional response, psychological response, has been fueling a uh, emerging field called biophilic design. And I want to talk about the principles of biophilic design in a kind of condensed form. It's, a, it's sort of a big and emerging field. I want to kind of simplify it a little bit to sort of give the, the flavor of it and show it how in, in a building, how it kind of put to use. So the principles are really um, kind of intuitive and obvious. I mean, we all know it's nicer to look at a garden than a machine, typically. There are some really great machines, actually. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so, so principle number one is visual and non-visual connection to nature. Now, this is Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Falling Water in Pennsylvania. If you haven't gone there, go. It's fantastic. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, embodiment of visual and non-visual connection to nature. We want to be in an environment where we can see the natural world, the things that are alive, things that are well, and we want to hear it as well. So here you put the, the, the house over the waterfall. You can hear the water. Some might think it's a little too much. My wife, for instance, um, uh, she says it has to make her go to the bathroom. But um, <laughs> um, anyway, but, but, but for me, it's perfect. Um, and you're seeing the movement of the trees. You see the movement of the birds. Um, and so it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's creating this environment that's, that the building is part of. Um, now, what I've put here in red are some of the, the specific things that some of the scientific research has, has shown about, for instance, this visual and non-visual connection lowers stress hormones, improves attentiveness and happiness. Uh, number two, in, related to that, is having natural materials and biomorphic forms in our environments. Um, this, again, seems kind of uh, intuitive, obvious as, as well. We like natural wood, we like stone, we like the shape of trees, plants, uh, animals, et cetera, the human form. Um, but a lot of our environments, uh, this room is a pretty good example, are fairly devoid of biomorphic forms. Um, the, the, the oak there is about it, aside from the, um, the plant, and the, the flower arrangement in the back of the room. And I could really use some stress-lowering hormones. Right <laughs> um, but anyway, so it, it can be very abstract. You think of the stained glass patterns of Frank Lloyd Wright. It can be very literal, uh, Art Nouveau, but we, we key at an instinctive almost level to those, to those forms and patterns. They help our blood pressure, increase our sense of comfort. Then we have complexity and order and non-rhythmic sensory stimuli. This is a more subtle thing, but uh, basically we want, the, we want the environment to be legible. We want to understand it, but we don't want it to be so ordered that it's boring because a really non-dynamic environment starts to shut us down. If it's totally steady state, our senses lose contact with that world. We want to hear the bird song. We want to hear the movement of the wind in the trees. We want to hear the water moving. Th these are the kind of non-rhythmic sensory stimuli that help our uh, lower stress response again. So um, finally, uh, prospect and refuge with moments of mystery and risk. This is really rich stuff for an architect because it's about how we put ourselves in space. And what's really fascinating about this is that uh, there have been some, some great studies on this in a, a book written by a guy named Dennis Dutton. It's called The Art Instinct. And he actually did a TED talk on it in which he asked the question, are we hardwired for beauty? And the answer is, he says, yes, and here's why. What we have looked for over those hundreds of thousands of years of evolution is an environment in which we can observe a savanna, a landscape that is life-giving to us. We want to see presence of water. We want to see diverse greenery. Uh, evident animal life, and we want to see it as a navigable pathway. So it's not a dense forest we can't see in. We, want to, we need a little more sense of ownership of that landscape. We want to see it from a raised position, but we want that position to have refuge. We need to have trees that we can climb up in or something we can hide in, uh, something at our back. So it's this yin and yang kind of environmental um, balance that we're looking for. And we patterned this. this is, these, are the, these are the places we selected in the landscape, and we feel good when we have that in our houses, in our workplaces, in our, in our uh, environments that we inhabit. And this is a screen porch on a house we did a year ago uh, 
Um, it's just the, the view is not the savanna, but it's a sense of prospect and refuge. Um, so that's very condensed. If you're really interested in this, I would suggest you look at the Terrapin Bright Green paper, 14 Patterns of Biophilia. It's, they go into great detail and, and more detail, and they cite all the scientific works that are supporting these patterns. So it's a great resource. Um, I didn't have time to go into all of it, but I want to give you a, an overview. And, and I have a bibliography, by the way, that at the end, if you're interested in, I can, uh, I can share with you. Um, also, International Living Future Institute has case studies on their Living Building Challenge site. You can see some of these things built in larger buildings, larger sites. But I wanted to show uh, an example of a small house. Um, this is a 30 foot by 126 foot lot in Oak Park. We're in design on this, hopefully going into construction next year. And it's a passive house which is uh, embodying biophilic elements. And I want to just quickly show how some of these principles um, happen here. So, uh, first of all, as passive house, we want to be oriented towards the environment in such a way that we can use sun to our advantage. Passive house is like passive solar, it has elements of that, but it primarily looks at keeping energy in the building via insulation and air tightness. So, when we uh, think of the building going on the site, I like to think of it like an animal. This is putting both the performance together with the biomorphic. So, I think of this big animal coming out of the site to settle in for a nap. And it wants to put its, its what I've designed as sort of a metal exoskeleton to the north, the cold north wind where there's no sunlight, and open up its warm underbelly to the south where it can get sun and it can get sun in the winter time. That's uh, winter solstice on the, on the left and summer solstice on the right. So it needs to be shaded so to not drive up those energy bills and create overheating and glare and discomfort in the summertime. And what we've done here with the shading uh, strategy is create small shading overhangs down lower so that we can grow plants up it. And so when we talk about that, sort of nestling into the site of this, of this animal of a building, um, it can be done with vines uh, that bring animals and, and plants to the building. And so we have this sense of looking out through something that's supporting life. It's not just all on the inside, it's not just all on the outside. So anyway, principle number one uh, for biomorphic design is that natural, uh, that visual and non-visual connection to nature. And this is something we all know. I mean, a house should have a garden, and it should be a nice garden. I think this is something we're, we're, we're sort of hardwired for. But here, the idea is to take it a little farther and to say, how can we create a microcosm of that, that primal savanna experience? And so in our climate here in Oak Park, or here in, in the Chicago region, we can create a prairie landscape uh, very easily. And we put water in it. We put native plants in it. We provide shelter and food for birds and other habitat, and we start to create this web of life that the more of these that get done, the, the, the stronger it is. So um, talking about water for a moment as a, one of the natural materials, this is a good example of sort of efficiency and, and biophilic design coming together. The water comes off of the roof, and instead of sending it to a storm system where it goes eventually to a sewer to get, use a lot of energy to get treated, you put it into the landscape. So we've designed these sort of dry creek beds that will take it to rain gardens where it can infiltrate back into the groundwater. In the meantime, creating a beautiful thing to look at that provides life for other species. So the more we can get other species to thrive, the more we thrive. That's the kind of the beauty of this is that it's not us or them. You know, we don't win this game unless everybody wins. So um, these uh, arrows here kind of show these, these connections, visual and non-visual by being able to hear and see and smell uh, this, this landscape around us. Um, the building's raised a little bit off the ground, so we get that sense of overlook, but not so much you feel disconnected from the landscape. And then by being able to capture the sky view in the middle of the house where the space opens up, we get that prospect to the sky as well. It's really important. I've always loved growing up in the Midwest, the, the, the changing sky, and it's a, it's a comforting thing to kind of know what weather is coming your way since it changes so much. Living in LA, it's like, you know, it's just, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue. Oh, there's fog. Oh my God, there's fog. Um, so that's prospect, but what about refuge? How do we feel secure? This is a small urban site. How do we make it feel like we can look out to that landscape, but not to feel like we're just exposing ourselves in a way that we feel uh, sort of, again, primally uncomfortable? And this is where those shading mechanisms that turn into vertical trellises start to do double duty, because when you put a screen relatively close to yourself, like a traditional uh, Munton window with small panes, um, when you're standing up close to it, it's easy to see out, but from a distance it becomes a plane that you can't see beyond. So it's a nice kind of optical effect of smaller, denser patterns closer to the building. 
So what it allows us to create is interstitial spaces between inside and outside that allow us to have privacy and a sense of space that we can garden in, or in the backyard, we can have a screened porch that we can sit and the rain can be falling on the roof over the green roof over our heads, and we can be enjoying dinner with our kids and, and what have you, and seeing the garden being there. So biophilic design is not gonna make it where we can just stay indoors all the time and just be perfect. We still need to work into our, uh, into our daily lives and into our buildings a way to get us outside. And so that's part of the, that's part of the, the message as well. Um, inside, uh, the idea is to try to create this, this sense of biomorphic form. The image here in this house is of a forest clearing, again, drawing on that native landscape. Uh, we had oak savannas around here and, and a lot of dense forests not far from our prairies. And so the idea of sort of discovery of a special magical place like that is a, is a moment that the family can kind of galvanize around. It's in the center of the house where the kitchen is. And so the idea is the beams, the, the columns from up below, from down below, rise up, create this sense of forest canopy, and um, light comes in from above over these planters that we have herbs and flowers growing in, so we get dappled light diffusing in through that, and try to create on the inside of a building a sense of what it's like when you're outside, the variety of spaces and the variety of materials, tactile materials that we can, that we can relate to and, and comfort us. So um, airflow is controlled by uh, a ventilation system, bringing uh, fresh air in all the time. It's a heat recovery ventilation system. This is a, a, a classic element of a passive house. We need to have fresh air. So it's a direct physical connection to the outside world. Um, but it needs to be done with heat recovery, so it's efficient. Um, in addition to that, there's some nice sort of low-tech devices that let the building operate like an organic hole. So we have thermostatically controlled fans that when we see the temperature is different enough between levels, they'll kick on, let that, mute, that, let that air come down, mix, rise back up, all the while being fed by that fresh air ventilation system. And then there's a new, some new lighting um, products on the market. There's one called Stack Lighting. There's one called uh, Philips Hue System. These are programmable bulbs that let you um, program them to change their LEDs that have different colors in them. So they, you can program them for different colors and brightness at different time of day. So our circadian rhythm is set by exposure to daylight when it's you know, bright out and dim light at night. So we can program these bulbs to go to dimmer, yellower light in the evening time at sunset. So it's a really nice thing. I, I have this on my computer screen as well as an app called Flux. And when it's sunset, it yellows down and you kind of go, oh, it's sunset. You know? So it puts you in touch with that, with that rhythm of the world. So this is one house. Um, it's a link in a chain. And so the longer and stronger that chain, the more we look at transforming the environment for everybody. But this idea of biophilic design scales up wonderfully well. And again, those uh, living building challenge case studies are some good examples. But think of this in, well, a conference center. Um, think of it in a, a library, a city street, a public square, and that our day-to-day -day experience of life is not sort of uh, either or. Either we're out in the woods or we're in the city. I mean, that's kind of how I feel when I live. I love walking in the woods. I joined the Arboretum so I can go there all the time, but why isn't that in my, why isn't that my neighborhood? So I wanna talk about transformative change really quickly in the last few slides. This is Chicago region, 1900. This is a USGS map, you can download these, it's great, I love maps. I added the green just to sort of illustrate what happens between then and almost 100 years later when we basically covered it all. And so this is not to say, woe is us, we're stuck with this. This is to say, look at the kind of change that we're capable with. That was the last century. So the question is, where are we gonna go forward in the next century? And we have to have a vision about what we want, how we wanna live. Is this the right balance or should we do better? How can we do better? So I'm gonna ask you for dream with me just for a minute on my kind of fantasy um, parallel universe. This is not my, my plan for Chicago. We're, I know this isn't gonna happen. Individuals don't design cities, cultures do. But it's a, it's a, a way for me to sort of think about what would a city look like with a whole different set of priorities? If you prioritized ecology as much as commerce and you wanted to put every citizen with a short walking distance to open lands. So, so here's what I did. I said, let's start with the waterways being sacrosanct. You have to have, no city can be within a mile of the Des Plaines River or the Chicago River or Lake Michigan. What if? Because then all the water coming off the city could infiltrate, could percolate and do what bioswales do, which is clean that water and let it go to its, uh, to its watershed. 
In the process, of course, that's where the wetlands are, and that's where a tremendous amount of life can form. Um, and so those buffer zones are open lands where we can all walk, and so can animals, and it's, a, it's like a, a, even, again, that yin-yang thing, it's sort of even city to open land. Um, now that means that we have this dense urban fabric, this sort of vital city in the midst of this, and if it forms in kind of a linear fashion, that makes circulation really easy. If these are, let's say, road and rail lines, you could raise them over the open land so that uh, deer or bison could walk from the Des Plaines River to Lake Michigan without becoming roadkill. People could walk freely on the ground plane. And, and then the perimeter between city and open land could be a, a, a mediated intermediate space of, of parks, of community gardens, this sort of intermediary between city and open space, but a place that people can cultivate and enjoy. Um, my nod to, to Rob, uh, this is my farm zone and that's my distribution center. So um, anyway, the question is, you know, not is rapid change going to happen, but what do we do with it? How do we look forward to the next century and think about what that vision is going to be? We deserve to thrive as a species, not merely survive, but we need to kind of get a vision of that and, and work toward it. And biophilic design provides us with the tools to make that vision reality. Thank you.